Hi, I'm John Safran um, from various TV shows, and I'm here at the Wheeler Centre talking to Christian Lander. Can you tell us apart? <laughs> I was thinking about a month ago, I did a tweet where I said, um, interesting fact, Julia Gillard and Lee Sales looks the same to Asians watching Late Line. And, <laughs> and I've got a feeling, yeah, any Asians watching this, they're going to get confused too, but you know... <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's understandable. I think I built a career on saying that all white people are the same. <laughs> now, your, your uh, blog seems to have, like, like a perfect storm. It seemed like an idea which time was coming. What's the idea behind it, and why do you think it blew up? Uh, the, I mean, the, the logic behind it or how it actually started? Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the, no, no, the logic behind it. Well, the, I mean, the logic behind it, there were, there were two real things that came out of it. It was, um, and two of them were the things I, I just grew up with in Toronto, uh, which is Melbourne with snow, for any of you that haven't been there. Um, one was my desperate need to point out how all white people think they're unique and they're not. And that came out of four years of graduate school, you know, when my eyes were finally opened and I was like, wow, these are actually the least tolerant people I've ever dealt with in my entire life. And the other one was to really sort of talk about the, uh, the idea of race and class being still so inextricably linked, and specifically among the liberal upper middle class, which is people who really don't want to recognize that race and class are still linked. So, so what's the race and class connection? Well, the fact is that this list that I've made, you know, this list of, of stuff white people like and everything that's on there is essentially a guide for how to join the liberal upper middle class. And so rather than looking at it, you know, and people recognize immediately that it's white. So for people who aren't white, and are looking to join the liberal upper middle class, it's more of an activity of becoming white than it is of joining this class. And so that was one of the things that just comes up over and over again. And that was something that emerged from my time in high school in Toronto. And I went to a really, really interesting high school. Uh, to give you an idea of my high school, it's called Jarvis Collegiate Institute. And sorry, this is going to take a while. Um, Jarvis Collegiate Institute. And to give you an idea of the ethnic makeup of the school, I played gridiron football. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I started at gridiron football at offensive line, for those of you who know what position that is. Uh, for those of you that don't, professional offensive linemen are usually six foot five, 300 pounds. High school offensive linemen are usually six foot at least 200 pounds. But when your school is made up predominantly of Chinese and Sri Lankan immigrants, I am one of the larger kids at the school. And our school was this really amazing mix of, you know, recent immigrants to Canada, third generation, Chinese Canadians, Indo-Canadians, uh, Jamaican Canadians, things like that. And what was amazing about the school was every ethnic conflict on earth played itself out in my school, more specifically on the gym mat of my uh, wrestling class, because my gym teacher had a political science degree, and <laughs> I think you can tell where this is going, and he would actually pit all the ethnic rivalries against each other in wrestling class. And so, you know, it was a good day when a Sri Lankan and a Tamil were wrestling. Uh, it was a better day when he would pair Ned the Croat against Marco the Serb. And, uh, and my school would just rush into the gym like it was the Roman Coliseum. And, uh, and before I get back to the point about race and class, there's another funny thing that happened. My, uh, my gridiron team was, we had a, a practice field that doubled as a helicopter landing pad for the hospital across the street. And we weren't a very good football team, so this was more comforting than it was upsetting. And that same area was also the main drag for transvestite prostitutes in the city of Toronto. And you know prostitutes, they work nights. And we practiced in the morning, so there was a little bit of overlap. And uh, being prostitutes, but also being Canadian, they had a good sense of humor. And every time we bent over, they whistled at us. <laughs> and so as a 15-year-old boy, forces you to come to grips with your sexuality awfully quickly because you realize you have options. Um, <laughs> but at this school, so at this school that had this mix of, you know, uh, of white Canadians and sort of third generation Canadians and first generation Canadians, the amazing thing was that if you liked anything on the list that, I, that I've written in the book and on the site, you were accused by your classmates and by your peers of being a banana, a Twinkie, an Oreo, a coconut, or whatever food stuff related to your skin color and had a white center. And... <laughs> So that was the idea that was so much behind the blog, that these things, these, these aspects of the liberal upper middle class are still so much about whiteness. And that was one of the things I wanted to And do to you have about. to be white to be white? No, you just have to be rich. <laughs> and have an inordinate amount of free time. Now, you went on Conan O'Brien, I saw on my television set yes. accidentally the other night. 
I mean, I would have gone out of my way to look at it. Yeah, this uh, I was on Conan. This is actually um, this is another long story, but it's a good one, I promise. Um, so the amazing thing was with my blog when it started. It was in January of two thousand and eight. So I started writing. Everything went really, really quickly. Um, by July first, two thousand eight, the book was published. By July fourteenth, the book was a New York Times bestseller. So it was literally six months from idea to the bestseller list, and it's one of the most amazing things in my life. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a New York Times bestseller. They they can't take this away from me. It's you know, it's not like winning Top Model. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going on here. Um, and then it was just this amazing thing. And then I found out in August of '08 that I'd been invited to be a guest on the Conan O'Brien show. And this was an enormous deal to me. I was absolutely freaking out. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to go on Conan O'Brien. So every day I would just hit refresh on the NBC website over and over again to find out who the real <laughs> celebrities were going to be. You know what I mean? Like who I was going to get to meet. And it finally came up that it was going to be Jerry O'Connell. Now, this is a very big deal to me. You've probably seen Jerry O'Connell most recently in the movie Piranha 3D where he had his um, penis bitten off by oh, a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. An angry fish. Um, but more importantly to me, he was in a movie called Stand By Me. And in that movie, he was a fat kid. And this is a big deal to me because I was a fat kid growing up. And Jerry O'Connell eventually grew up to the point where he married a swimsuit model, which makes him a hero to fat kids everywhere across the world. <laughs> so when I found out he was going to be on Conan O'Brien, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to meet my fat kid idol. This is incredible. So I got to New York, and I was in my dressing room at Conan O'Brien, and I just remember sitting in that room thinking, don't throw up, don't throw up, don't throw up, don't throw up, and I, I didn't vomit, which was great. And I was thinking, what do you do backstage at a show like Conan O'Brien? I was like, I really like Jerry O'Connell. Do I, can I just go over to his dressing room and knock on his door and be like, hey, uh, hey Jerry, uh, you don't know me, but uh, do you remember when you were fat? Right? Like, <laughs> Not only could that be humiliating in the moment, I just had the feeling that he'll go on the show and be like, Conan, who is that weirdo backstage who's really obsessed with fat children? <laughs> and then it'll be super awkward. I go on there. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go to his dressing room. I'm going to pretend like I've been here before. So I'm just waiting in there, you know, controlling my, my nausea. And there's a knock at my dressing room door. And it's Jerry O'Connell. He looks at my agent. And my agent kind of looks like me. Um, and he goes, are you, are you the stuff white people like I? Are you the stuff white people like I? And my agent just slowly points up at me and he goes, oh my God, I love that site. And I'm trying to get like one word in here. I'm trying to be like, you were awesome in sliders. You were so good at nothing. And he won't, he, he won't let me get one word in. He's like, oh, I read that site all the time. It's so funny. Everything you write in there is incredible. Oh, it's so funny. It's awesome. Oh, it's so good. Listen, man, when the show's over, stick around. There's people I want you to meet, but I got to go out there and do it right now. All right, I'm out. Boom, gone. Right. And I'm freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, I think I just met Jerry O'Connell. Right. And I can't believe it. So Jerry O'Connell goes out on stage, and he's hilarious, and he just tears it up, and he's awesome. And then the other guest was uh, Tim Gunn, the host of Project Runway in the U.S. And finally, it's my turn to go out there. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really stuck. I'm actually going to be on Conan O'Brien. This is incredible. So again, I did what the layout was. Um, like, if you were Conan, you know, to change your hair color a little bit and grow a few inches, um, I'd be here, Tim Gunn was here, and then Jerry O'Connell was on the end. And everything from this point on is based on the T-Vote episode of the show because I blacked out the whole time I was on stage. I don't remember any of this actually happening. So we're sitting on stage, and Conan asked me my, the first question. He's like, so Christian, what are some things that white people like? And, you know, I respond. I'm like, well, you know, farmer's markets. And, you know, Conan laughs politely. He's like, yes, we, we do like farmer's markets. And, you know, Tim Gunn's very polite. He's like, oh, yes, you know, it's a very nice place to shop. And Jerry O'Connell's like this, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's where I get my onions. And, and I'm looking over. I'm like, man, my fat kid idol is just loving this. This is incredible. And so the next question comes up. And Conan's like, well, Christian, we've got Tim Gunn on the show, Project One. Like, what are some clothes that white people like? And I'm about to answer when I feel this, this pinch on my cardigan sweater, which I didn't realize I was wearing today, but apparently I wear it all the time. I feel this pinch. And I look over, and Jerry O'Connell has reached over Tim Gunn and is pinching my sweater, looking at me going, sweaters, white people like sweaters, they like sweaters. <laughs> and now you've got to imagine, you know, you, you think, you want to believe that you're a really cool customer and then you can look your fat kid idol in the eyes and be like, got it, Jerry, Conan, they like sweaters, am I right? No, instead I freeze, I freak out, I'm like, why is he pinching me? Why is he pinching me? <laughs> And I look back at Conan and I go, uh, shorts? <laughs> and Jerry hits the deck. He's like, oh my God. That's the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and I was like, man, this is the greatest thing ever. I mean, the audience wasn't laughing, but Jerry was loving it. 
And so then I, I get backstage and I'm just like, oh my God, that was amazing. I was just on Conan O'Brien. I got to call some ex-girlfriends. <laughs> And, and I did, for the record, actually. Um, and I hear my name. So Christian, Christian, Christian. And I turn around, and it's, it's Jerry O'Connell. He's like, oh, remember I told you I wanted you to meet some people after the show? Here they are. It's my parents. <laughs> I literally met this man, like, 45 minutes ago. And now I'm hanging out with his parents backstage at the Conan O'Brien show. And so we make small talk for a few minutes. And then Jerry's like, look, man, let me get your email, your phone number. When we get back to L.A., we should all go out to dinner. And I'm like... Yeah, sure thing, Jerry. Uh, not because it's a super Hollywood thing, but because I know I can never let this, this dinner happen because Jerry's Jerry. You know, he's tall, he has a six-pack, great hair, and he's married to a swimsuit model who is Mystique in X-Men. And, uh, you know, I'm me. And, uh, and I'm married to my wife. She's very pretty, but she's, she's short and sort of pale and has, you know, reddish hair. And I just have this nightmare in my head the second he asks it that I'm going to be at the supermarket checkout line and I'm going to flip through the magazine and there's going to be a picture of all four of us and it says, Jerry and Rebecca grant a couple their dying wish. <laughs> and so I knew, I was like, I know I'm not going to make this dinner happen. And then two, two weeks later, I'm on a different TV show called Carson Daly, which is a lot like Conan O'Brien, except a lot worse. And, um, and I'm, in, I'm in the dressing room, and I look up, and there's a picture of Jerry O'Connell. My wife's like, look, you were never going to get another non-creepy opportunity to send him an email. You've got to do it. So I take my phone out, and I send him a quick little message. I'm like, hey, Jerry, it's Christian. I don't know if you remember when we were on Conan together. Uh, I'm going to be on Carson Daly tonight, and I'm in the dressing room, and there's a picture of you. I thought it was kind of funny. Christian. Boop. Awesome. I'm teabooing it right now. Jerry. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making any of this up. And so you've got to remember that like nine months ago, I was just starting this website as a joke. And now I'm like, oh my God, I might have to get a restraining order against Jerry O'Connell. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that was my experience of, uh, of going on the, uh, on the Conan O'Brien show. Now, a little I, long-winded, I'm sorry. I warned you before you came on not to do your target material mm -hmm. because um, it's confu that's the one confusing thing for an Australian audience when they're reading the hipster target shtick. What, what's going on there? Because it's, it's not the hipster place here in Australia. Yeah, Target, I mean, target in America is, you know, we have uh, Philip Stark design stuff is in there and it's just, you know, your, your choices are really limited between like Walmart and Target and Walmart's the worst place on earth. If you've ever been to one, it's, it's hell. Um, and Target's just like a little bit nicer hell. Sure. And in America, that's kind of your, uh, your options. And do they have the... Uh, when, I, when I went to Walmart in America, yeah. they had um, the things. Oh, the rascals. Yeah, where, where like it was very ambi... It was like fat people were yes. on them, right? Yeah. And I couldn't quite prove that they were only on them because they were lazy. Yeah. But are they well, all Walmart? <laughs> <laughs> well, if they're Walmart's own rascals, that means that they arrived there without the rascal and they just used it for shopping at Walmart. But yeah. Sure. Understand. Now, the serious side behind your website, do you, do you think um, class is um, more of an important thing than race? I think the two are they're, they're fundamentally linked and you, you can't break the two apart. But I think class, especially in what I'm writing about, is, 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 is really, really front and center. And especially in America where people don't even want to recognize that class exists, it really does. And so in my, in my book and on the site, I always mention you know, the right kind of white people and the wrong kind of white people. Uh, the easiest definition is the wrong kind of white people are those who disagree with the right kind of white people. So wealthy conservatives, bogans, et cetera. And... Um, and it, it, it's defining this class. And I think what was, what was so amazing was to realize all of these rules that come along with being a part of this class. And that's what I wanted to lay out in the book is that there are certain things. And if you're going to be a part of this class to understand how – not necessarily difficult it is to join, but what you have to understand as a prerequisite before you join the class. So one of the things is you have to understand the ridiculous competition between white people. I mean it is literally exhausting. I have to check 15 music blogs before I leave the house every morning. <laughs> And it's, it, it, it was just a really important thing to get out. Now, I'm confused whether anyone besides hipsters care about hips, like, hate hipsters. <laughs> <laughs> because I, cause I was watching a Honda commercial mm -hmm. that was making fun of hipsters, yeah. and I just couldn't get to the bottom of whether this was aimed at non-hipsters to go, oh, yeah, they're them and they're vinyl and shit. Yeah, but then I was thinking, I've never met a non-hipster who who hates hipsters or even enters their radar. 
Yeah, most most non hipsters don't have the free time to constantly figure out new ways to hate other hipsters. It's one of the weirdest, <laughs> most amazing self loathing experiences I've ever seen in my life. I mean, but realistically, in defense of hipsters, um, for obvious reasons, you know, we are. Uh, as hipsters, we're competing for very limited resources. There's only so many thrift shops to go around. There's only so many vinyl pressings to go around. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty cutthroat. And, you know, our resources are not unlimited. So when I see someone who looks like me, I know that we're going uh, to be competing for the same cardigans. <laughs> So that's why I have so much rage and outward hatred to other hipsters. Now, what it, the comment section of your blog is like? It's, yeah. it's like every Nazi. <laughs> it's like the boys from Brazil have come back and, yeah. and just are entering comments. What, why? And but you don't get rid of them. No, uh, it's actually it's really been funny to see what's happened with the site and with the comments. So, in the one of the first weird experiences I had with the blog was I saw where some of the incoming links were coming from. And one of the things that linked to my site was actually a white supremacist site. And it was the weirdest thing ever to read their comments on their site. They liked it. They thought it was really funny. I was like, oh, my God, what have I done? And then I was reading. They, they had their own suggestions for the site. Um, <laughs> things, li- things like ethnic purity. <laughs> uh, living with my own kind. You know, my cultural history, whatever. And it was, just, it was shocking to see that. But the site itself... Just the comments are absolutely insane. And one of the things that I, I detest about, about liberals, and I mean, I, I, I'm very much a, a liberal myself, is, is their need to sort of sanitize everything when it comes to race. And this was my time in graduate school. No one was ever being honest with themselves. And everyone just glossed over any sort of alternative idea in terms of racism, even wrong ideas, and just wanted to shut down all conversation unless it was reinforcing what people already believed. And so the comments that go on the site, they are, make no mistake, they're horrible, horrible comments from horrible, horrible people. But the truth is, if I were to delete the comment on the site, I don't delete the person or the sentiment that led to that comment being up there. So it's much better to have the other commenters on the site. Not all of the people who comment are Nazis or morons. I mean, there's a lot of very intelligent people on there who, um, who, who write back. And what I think it leads to is this incredible, um, you know, this dialogue that goes down. And I think that if you read it as a completely neutral observer, it's impossible for you not to come out on the side of the right, you know, not the right wing, sorry, the right as in the, the correct side, which <laughs> as a liberal is inherently not the right side. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see that engagement. I think by deleting it, I don't add anything. I think I, think I take things away. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I, I stopped reading them myself because there were a lot of personal attacks on me, which is fine. I think everyone has a right to attack me and tell me how awful I am. But it, it started hurting me after a while as a writer because the two things they'd usually say is you're a racist or you're not funny. And the one calling me not funny was, was, was really the one that hurt because I, I don't know for a fact. Calling me a racist didn't hurt. I mean, I have like two black friends. So I know for a fact that I'm not racist. <laughs> And I have a Buddha statue at home, so I'm clear on that one. I've checked the boxes, but it's much harder to prove that you're funny than it is that you're not racist. So, yeah. So, but my commenters, if I can digress for a second, have had some of the stuff they write on there is so much funnier than I could ever write. Um, one was talking about a liberal. Uh, the joke I made was on an entry about the Ivy Leagues, that everyone in America and in Canada always says their school is the Harvard of the South, the West, whatever, whatever, whatever. And one of the commenters goes... Um, my people say that my art school is the Harvard of art schools. Does that mean I'm white? Comment underneath. No, it just means you're throwing your life away. <laughs> and I was just like, hats off, brilliant. <laughs> couldn't have thought it. Couldn't have said it anything. Now, what's myself. your new book called? Uh, the new book that's coming out in November is called Whiter Shades of Pale, and uh, it's a regional guide to white people across the United States. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so, so what are some of the, out of the right sort of white people, what are some of the subsets of the... Well, the subsets, right? it's regional. So you go, there's certain places in the U.S. that has an abundance of white people. So any college town has mostly graduate students. Madison, Wisconsin, Austin, Texas, San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, New York, Brooklyn as well. They get two separate entries. Um, and Toronto and Montreal actually made a list as well. Pretty good. Hey, we've got um, microphones and stuff, so if anyone's got a question, yes. So. Yeah, would well, you have any more questions for me? No, you know. Uh, <laughs> what's up with Asian women? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Good question. 
Um, so that's an interesting topic. Uh, my, uh, so my book uh, and the blog, Post Number 11, says that white people like Asian women. And I would like to apologize in advance. I actually didn't write that post. My friend Miles, who's Filipino and outwardly racist, <laughs> towards white people and Asian people as well. So he, he, he hates everyone equally. Um, he actually wrote that entry and has taken a fair amount of flack for it, uh, mostly because it's true. And I think that's what <laughs> seems to bother people more than anything else. Fair enough. No, that's all the questions I have. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, it just when I first read your um, web, website, it, w- it was hysterically funny. And, uh, but I couldn't believe how much it related to me coming from... <laughs> <laughs> But coming from, coming from Melbourne, like, how can it be that similar in Canada and Melbourne? And I was just wondering, have you thought about, like, 20 years ago, would it have been the same sort of thing? And in the future, do you think we'll become even more of a monoculture? Yes. Uh, I think it's clear coming into the second book, white people haven't learned anything from this book. We're all doing exactly the same stuff as before. I mean, the number of fixed gear bikes here has actually increased since the last time I was here. I was hoping that pointing, I mean, I still ride one, all right, so let's be honest, but I I was hoping that maybe I could at least learn a lesson and maybe make myself less pretentious, but I was unable to do it. I think it's been, it's been funny about the monoculture because we're so conditioned and taught to believe that we're not that way. I mean, we spend, our parents spend a ridiculous amount of time raising us to believe, you know what, you're unique and you're special and you're creative and you're awesome and you're great. And we just get reinforced that over and over and over again. And so what was amazing, it's created this group of people that can be sold to so easily. And the way that you sell to us is you say, if you buy this thing, you will be perceived as intelligent, as creative, as great, as not racist, as caring about the environment. I mean, how else do you justify $20 for a moleskin notebook? (laughs) You know, $2 spiral notebooks take the exact same notes down. You don't get a creativity boost like it's a role-playing game. Um... (laughs) But we, but, we, but we buy it because we want other people to see it and say, oh, look, that person is creative. They're more connected to writers from the past. <laughs> and we, we, we do it. And so what happens is that we, we have entered into this predictability of this monoculture that we just want to buy things that make us feel better about ourselves, that remind us that you know, we are good, we are creative, we are intelligent. And this is why I talk about, you know, I'm, I'm actually petrified about the future of books, specifically ebooks, because, I mean, what's the point of reading a book if people can't see that you've read it? <laughs> like, if someone comes to my house, I'm just going to have to hand them my Kindle and be like, yep, flip through it. <laughs> Keep looking. Finished. All of them. Every single one. Even that super long Jonathan Franzen book. I got it. Uh, <laughs> But I think until we actually start recognizing that what we're doing is self-absorption that we're pretending is altruism, I don't think we're going to have any changes. We're going to keep wanting to buy things and do things that just reaffirm the stuff that our parents have told us that, yes, we're creative, we're smart, we're unique. And we're really not. I mean, I think this list is further proof that we're really not as unique as we think we are. So, yeah, it's not going to get any better anytime soon. (laughs) Sorry. Oh, by the way, with your magpies... No, I lost Colin $20 Woodfield, on the AFL the final. I'm not answering this person. question. <laughs> I bet $20 on St. Kilda, and I lost. Yeah, they're all right. But, uh, that's funny you say that, because um, I go for Collingwood because my dad goes for Collingwood, and I vote, probably I vote liberal because my dad votes liberal, but I'm an actor, and everyone in, who, who acts votes Labor. And um, it's a really weird thing that everything just gets passed down, and when you... When you hit, like, like in drama school, I just got really attacked because I voted for the side that was bad. Um, <laughs> and I didn't know why, but how do you... My question is, how do you get um, over what your parents have drilled into you as right? How, how do you, what's your solution to make your own, I don't know, creativity or your own um, opinion? Well, I think we have a, we, we especially, uh, our generation has been faced with something really 
different, which was, I mean, our parents were, I mean, and they failed at this, but our, our parents and everything that they did was, was a rebellion against their own conservative parents. You know what I mean? For the most part, that was the 60s, and you know what I mean? It was rebelling against this, this conservative sort of oppressive lifestyle. And then how do we possibly rebel against hippie parents? You know what I mean? Like, we don't, you can't rebel against hippie parents by becoming a conservative. It just doesn't work that way. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't happen except in sitcoms. So it becomes, I mean... It becomes really, really hard. I mean, that, that's one of the problems. I mean, that's one of the things that the book and the blog points out is that finding identity has become really, really difficult for us. And instead of actually doing something about it, we just end up looking back inside at ourselves and doing all of this really selfish stuff that we try to pretend is you know, artistic and creative and we compete against other people to prove that we're better than them. And so we're, we're lost and we're empty. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but there's definitely an emptiness there that we're, we're trying to fill with all of these things. And I, I don't know how we're going to fill it. Unfortunately. Sorry, that's a lot sadder of an answer than I was hoping for. Uh, music? I, I mean, I, I don't know what to say, how we, uh, how we rebel against our parents. I wish, I wish I had a better answer. Set some fires, maybe? I, I, I don't, small fires. And what do you reckon is at the bottom of this obsession with, like, authenticity? Uh, I th- it's just... Because, again, I'm talking about hipsters competing for resources, right? The more authentic it is, right, the, the less there is of it. And I think that's possibly a rebellion against mass culture. And, I mean, I, I haven't fully figured that out yet. Sure. Unless we're talking about food. Then there's a different story. <laughs> My absolute need to be the only white person in an ethnic restaurant. Now, when do, when do ethnicities, we kind of touched on this before, but um, just yesterday uh, a Cuban-American CNN host, Rick Sanchez, got fired because he, in an interview when he was promoting a book, he was talking about John Stewart and was going, listen, that guy's trying to pass him off as some kind of minority, like, because he's Jewish, but he's just, come on, he's white. And, like, you know, what's the big deal? And a few things about Jews in the media. And then he's fired. And then everyone's criticising Rick Sanchez and going, well, you're kind of right for saying that John Stewart's kind of might as well be white, but you're, you might as well be white also. Yeah, uh, that's not really much of a secret, like that I'm that I'm white. No, no, no. It's it's like at what point does a does an ethnicity become just blended into the rest and and no longer has minority status and the right to kind of present itself as a minority? That's a really hard question. I I I I I, I don't know when it when it reaches that point. I mean, especially Sanchez is in a, a very unique position, especially where he was on CNN. And it, it can be very hard when you start talking about other ethnicities. I mean, basically, the, the ethnicity that it's always safe to talk about is white. And there's no, there's no question about that. But the other ones, we still clearly haven't reached a level of cultural understanding where it's okay to talk about other races like that. And I think his firing was proof of that. Sure. Any, anyone else got any questions about race? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just with white people being in on the joke. You know, white people love to think that they're in on the joke of stuff. White Self-deprecating humor is on the list. <laughs> <laughs> no, I cover all my bases here. Don't don't worry about it. In on the joke of the whole phenomenon. And do you think that that means that they can absolve themselves in their own mind of actually having to engage with the issues of race and class that you're really trying to get at? Well, I think one of the things was in in, in writing this, I. It's all going to depend on the person, absolutely. And one of the things I learned from just spending so much time in graduate school, and I was in grad school for um, English literature, so uh, I just so much time of having these other students just, just literally beat these ideas into your head. I found that the students that they were trying to teach weren't listening at all. No one would talk about anything. It completely crushed all conversation. So the idea of taking an idea and just making it so straightforward and so blunt and just hitting someone over the head with it, I found wasn't powerful at all. If they didn't agree with it, they would turn it off immediately. And I think that wrapping it in humor for the people that do get it and realize what's going on there and, and arrive at the conclusion on their own rather than have me force feed it to them, I think it's a much more powerful conclusion, but some people miss it. And so I get people who come up to me all the time and say, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for letting me know I finally have a culture. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and I mean, look, they paid for the book, so I'm not going to trash them to their face, but... Uh, <laughs> But it's heartbreaking. I want to say this, this, isn't a, this isn't a culture. This is a shopping list, you know? And so I think that, that is one of, one of the problems that, come, that comes in there is when you, when you make a, a message that, that, that's subtle and wrapped in humor, there are people who aren't going to get it. But I actually, I strongly, strongly prefer it that way. And 
Yeah, so there's going to be some misinterpretations and there are going to be some white people who are never going to recognize that they're doing anything wrong. And what, 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 how do you compare it with other cultures? Like, what, what are other cultures doing that's right in this area that white people are doing wrong, or at least the right type of white people are doing wrong? So, wait, are you asking me to evaluate all other races yes. right now against white people to see who's winning? Yep. <laughs> how am I supposed to do that? I don't have rankings on how other, uh, other cultures are, are doing against white people. All I know is what white people are up to. Sure. Um, I, I don't even know. What am I, I don't know how to get out of this one. What am I, what am I supposed to say here? Okay. Uh, Asians and Indians are doing a fantastic job. Congratulations. <laughs> keep, keep it up. Keep up the good work. Black people too. Everybody, round of applause. <laughs> Any other questions? Coming off that one? You want me to rank your race right now? Is that what you'd like <laughs> 